Hi, everybody. I hope you're well. Uh, today I will read from a book titled Tricks and Robert Hausman, edited by Freddy Fishley and Niels Olsen and published by Edition Patrick Frey. In 1981, Robert Hausmann wrote, In the early 70s, we began once again to explore mannerism and illusionism in detail. This was as much due to our search for alternative forms of expression as to our growing doubts about certain dogmas of modernism, a modernism whose, in our eyes, increasing commercialization and internationalization was partly to blame for the rampant poverty of expression. At the time, virtually no one spoke of mannerism within the context of contemporary architecture and design. It was probably at the latest after the publication of Gustave René Hoch's book The World as Labyrinth, 1957, that the idea emerged that the term mannerism could be used not only to refer to the period in the 16th and 17th century, but also more generally to describe all movements in art that rejected a rigid classicism. In contrast to modern painting and sculpture in which the Mannerist legacy evolved in various directions, modern architecture was never particularly interested in this. In their fight against meaningless ornamentation and a superficial historicism, its protagonists discarded many forms of expression that had been practiced and handed down over the centuries. The purification process obviously required much renunciation. Nor was there room in new building for illusionistic techniques which would have been regarded as fraudulent. And Mallory's conceptions of wonder, amazement, labyrinthine or mystery would also have been rejected, as they would have been regarded as the mere attempt to deny architecture its artistic character and rob it of its irrational elements in an effort to align it to social and economic criteria. Our excursion into the past soon made clear that there is little new to invent, but much to be reinterpreted and rewritten. Within this context, we were initially interested in the following design elements. A material alienation, generated by the early interpretation of a particular material idea, illusion instead of imitation. The creation of illusionary space created by mirroring. Mirrors enable the optical dissolution of volume, endless space, spatial adjustments, illusionary symmetries, etc. The illusory alteration of volume or space through painterly means, including the application of all kinds of perspectives and their spatial form of anamorphosis, the use of contrast between light and dark, foreground and background, etc. The illusory alteration of volume or space through sculptural means, including built perspectives and anamorphoses. Literary forms like allegory, metaphor, paraphrase, quotation, used to establish through the use of design elements a connection to external contexts. Complexity, ambiguity, multiple coding, a design method that conveys the messages on different levels, thus making it open to interpretation. The inclusion of conflict, disorder, destruction, like the questioning of a work using its own design elements. We began to experiment in the context of smaller building projects in order to learn more. When our interests became more theoretical, we explored individual themes more intensely in order to better understand this. It was in this way that our so-called Lehrstücke were created in the form of models and objects. We chose the form of intellectual models because we did not wish to add an additional verbal manifesto to the many pre-existing ones. It was a question here of presenting design problems using design elements, as model objects still free of proportion and purpose, which lent themselves particularly well to this purpose. 
Our intention is to continue these Lehrstücke. New ones will explore the problem of combining various stylistic forms, anamorphosis and the superposition of functions. The first of these Lehrstücke, each of which is accompanied by an example from the field of architecture and industrial design, are presented in this issue. All these works arise from an approach to which we have given the working title of critical mannerism. It is not an issue here of a recipe or a new design method that can meet all the demands of all tasks, but rather of the attempt to revisit lost traditions and their evolution and contemporary reinterpretation. One main criteria of mannerist design was and is the scrutinizing of familiar, and thus habitual thinking and behavior patterns. Mannerist methods are critical, sometimes even subversive. They turn against established ideas of order and value, against rigidity of any kind. They allow for a liberation which includes humor, irony and, not least, self-irony. With regard to illusionism as an element of mannerist design, it must be said that this was never a question of deception in the sense of a fraud. The viewer must always remain free to decide if he wishes to follow the challenge of experiencing the illusion and perceiving this with his senses. Enough said about the intellectual background of our new mannerist experiments. We are aware of the difficulties of our experiment, of attempting to connect in a personal and visionary way tried and tested modernist methods of which we are a product with traditions from history without throwing all this in the pot of a diffuse postmodernism. Those who try to re-experience established craft techniques must see the danger of maneuvering in the vicinity of kitsch. Nevertheless, we are more interested in the last glass master who can cut a bevel than in the last snow leopard. We think it is high time that some sort of WWF is established to save dying crafts. Walking on a tight rope may run the risk of ending in a fall, but it does provide a better view. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.